Nous suivons un rythme. So we're going to pick up the pace a bit. The reason for that is that the TGV will not wait for us. And we still have two or three subjects to deal with. So to cover the next subject, what, are, what is our personal cultural data worth? Let me call on Monique Kantosperbo. I won't introduce her, but I will just say one thing about her, just one thing, because we have practically no time. I'll say that fundamentally you are a philosopher. You've written many books, and when we look at what you're going to try to tackle here, the title which seems to be the most important is The Paradoxes of Knowledge. And via this title, and here I'm speaking to the students present, I think we can find all forms of philosophy represented there. And I'm not sure that we're dealing with philosophy in personal cultural data, but I am sure that in the person and the culture, we are very close to philosophy. So let me let you introduce the very eminent persons around you who are going to help you cover the subject. Thank you very much. Assez animé, je pense. Well, I think we'll have a very lively discussion on the use which may be made of data, which people leave online in all sorts of activities of cultural behavior, which, of course, go well beyond voluntary forms of behavior. So we'll begin this meeting by presenting a study, a very fascinating study carried out by Ernst & Young, which Bruno Perrin will be entrusted with presenting, telling you what the main ideas are, with the help of Fabrice Natowski and Solen Blanc. And then after that, we'll have a quick conversation with Jan Thibault, who represents one of the two musical streaming giants in Southern Europe, in this case, Spotify, which is a Swedish group. And then with Stefan Wachenfeld, who is an entrepreneur from the internet world and uh, distribution of German games, and Rudi Klausnitzer, who is an Austrian writer, who is also an expert in these matters of big data. Well, perhaps you'd like to sit down first. And before we introduce this study, and you will see here that there's another study by Philippe Torres, Atelier BNP Paribas. Before starting with all of that, I should like to sketch out quickly the background of our discussion. We are obviously plunged into a digital world. We've been talking about that and virtually nothing else since the beginning of our forum. And the capacity of action that this has given us has considerably increased our ability to act and to be present. Our relationship to time has also amplified the links that we create with other human beings and other objects that we identify or not. That uh, is ever more detachable, can be integrated into vast sets, can be the subject of calculations, and give us the possibility to predict our behavior, sometimes orientations or choices that we make. and the specific direction which little by little will be stamped onto cultural supply. And so I think it will be, in that context, very interesting to listen and to reflect on the ideas and theses of the people who we'll be hearing from. So let's begin with the presentation of the Ernst & Young study for the Avignon Forum on cultural behavior and personal data at the heart of big data. Bruno Perrin.
You'll remember that about a year ago, we concluded our study saying that the battle between the big digital players and telecoms and the media had moved and was now happening around personal data. And we worked with the think tank of the Avenue Forum all year long about what those cultural personal data might be. Cultural data are the production of works which allowed us up until the end of the 20th century to reconstruct the history of our civilizations to forge our knowledge and our culture. The fact of choosing a slide where you see on why as a reflection of our study, that's because it symbolizes two things. First of all, a civilization that we have a difficulty understanding because it didn't leave many traces behind it. And secondly, a certain image of serenity facing the wave of big data that you see, 45 million mails sent in one single day. The beginning of a digital age and our immaterial traces, which can be collected and analyzed infinitely has left a certain number of people the possibility to predict what is going to happen with this huge quantity of data that has come out not only of the 2.3 billion homo connexus but of their 20 billion connected objects we find a category of data which are worth gold or at least four times more than other forms of data according to studies and those are personal cultural data Personal cultural data is a mirror of our tastes, our aspirations, and reflect the social image that we wish to send out to others. It reflects the digital world where culture is the human race. But thanks to these new capacities of machines and calculating devices, these cultural data can now be connected to other data and made fully contextualized. It becomes possible to peer into the depths of people's souls, and Fabrice will tell us more about this, but there is not actually a legal framework which regulates all of this. And Digital Champions understood this before other people by taking art, books, music, and other forms of culture, investing in that not simply because it was a beautiful gesture. And here I think we'll look at the polysemic nature of the word data, but when we have this discussion, but these personal cultural data have value. And to illustrate this, I should like to show you how since the first Avignon Forum, certain performance indicators have evolved. We had a look at three categories of players, the new champions of digital affairs, media and telecoms, and we looked at the top five of these. According to three criteria, capitalization on the stock exchange, which is basically value, available cash, and job creation. And over the five years, Digital Champions did three times, two to three times more. Medias are basically stable, and Telecom Champions are dropping off somewhat. So the fact of this continued growth by Digital Champions, there are consequences for the big data market, which because of its characteristics and its growing weight, are getting closer, particularly in Europe, to an essential resource, as in the last century we might have considered railroads or telecoms. And this leads us at EY to consider we're going into an area of considerable turbulence, which will be expressed either by the application of antitrust regulation or more probably through a voluntary opening up by digital giants to alliances with players in the cultural field or opening up of data to new agents in that area. Perhaps Fabrice can tell us a bit about the legal notions that I've just mentioned. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Yes, I think there is one main observation, namely that there is no such thing as a legal definition per se of uh, cultural or personal data, but law has provisions uh, regarding uh, private and personal data in the field of uh, personal freedom, first of all. You can demonstrate, easily demonstrate, that cultural data is always a personal data almost necessarily so, because if you order a book on Amazon, for, for instance, Amazon 
will be familiar with your taste, uh, with your political opinions, religious opinions, philosophical ideas. So these are uh, personal data which will enable you to directly or indirectly quantify individuals, but there are also sensitive data, so we'll have to come back to the legal framework for the protection of data that are personal data. And then there is another observation which ties in with what was said by Bruno about the economic dimension. There is a economic challenge at stake here and an issue of critical mass when it comes to controlling personal data. When we talk about critical mass, we need to discuss the item of uh, sharing information in order to facilitate innovation, uh, the sharing of knowledge. And this challenge is also uh, provided for by law. Uh, the law of competition looks at it because uh, if uh, you have an infrastructure and if you have resources that, that are uh, personal resources, it needs to be um, put into a frame and the holder of the infrastructure has to be who can be constrained to give access or grant access to this data. So political authorities can uh, take measures to uh, promote the sharing of data. And then there is also the IP dimension, the protection of the holder of the idea, the intellectual property provisions. So I would like to compare the legal frameworks when it comes to data protection. There are two different types of visions. There is the European way of looking at things, thinking that personal data are a fundamental right. So in Europe, we protect individual freedoms, we protect the citizens' data, and then there is the North American vision of things, which aims at protecting consumers. Well, actually, it's more complicated than this. There are 500 laws in America on the data security. There are sectorial laws, depending on the type of data. But at the end of the day, what is being protected in America is the consumer and what the FTC sanctions is uh, um, disingenuous information. Uh, uh, this is uh, what we call, what they call, deceptive uh, messages. Uh, we have been discussing Europe to a large extent since the beginning of the Forum d'Avignon, and uh, Europe has been criticized. But I think we should praise the European institutions because there is a European directive uh, that uh, grants uh, protection to these data, and there will also be a text uh, strengthening the uh, legal protection. There will be uh, sanctions up to 5% of uh, global GDP, strengthening uh, the right of citizens, the right to forget, the right to, to portability, and also strengthening the uh, um, measures that need to be taken by companies uh, when it comes to protection. So this could be a competitive advantage because by having a strong and solid legal framework, there will be more trust, more confidence in Europe, and therefore there will be, uh, to a greater extent, a sharing of uh, knowledge. May I ask you a few questions, Bruno Perrin and Fabrice Naftarski, before Solène Blond, uh, um, touches upon the economic issues, uh, first of all. Uh, first of all, I think in order for us to understand what we're talking about, could we come back to the issue of personal data? Could you very briefly tell us what exactly is a personal data? What is the difference between personal data and what used to be called nominative data? And also, I would like you to answer the following question. These cultural, personal data, do they have a specific value? Uh, versus other pos personal data used by uh, any users in a connected world, all these traces that uh, we leave behind us. These data are personal data, but are they cultural data? They can only be, be cultural data if they are uh, linked to a cultural behavior. I may be wrong, in which case you will tell me so. Uh, but there must be algorithms and uh, calculations that will uh, enable a, uh, an institution to predict the uh, cultural behavior of an individual or of a group. Again, we need to extend this to groups as well, not just individuals. So these personal uh, data, personal cultural data, what are they exactly? Um, is it to do with uh, people talking about their taste in food, for instance? And what is the added value? Mm. 
Now, is this uh, added value uh, granted by the market, the markets uh, in which uh, they uh, are present? And then one last question about law, Mr. Atersky. Uh, there are legislation in place. Uh, there is legislation in place. There are directives in the EU. One directive is in the pipeline for next year, I believe, 2014. A directive will be uh, adopted. But what are the uh, main strengths of this directive? Will it aim at uh, strengthening the issue of consent, so uh, previous consent, the, which is basically the only thing that really exists, <coughs> the only standard that exists, even though it's not a binding standard? Will there be a right to portability, so any Internet user will be able to use his data to take his data with him when he changes operators. What are the main uh, highlights of the directive? Well, there are many questions I'll try to answer. Well, personal versus nominative data, well, there is no difference there. The uh, law on uh, data confidentiality in 1995 talked about uh, nominative data. Now the directive talks about personal data. So when the directive was transposed, we went uh, uh, for the word uh, personal data or données à caractère personnel. But legally speaking, it is exactly the same. So that's the first question. The second question now about the development and further development in the future. Now, one observation. In Europe, data are subject to a fundamental law, but the practice in terms of data protection are declarations, uh, previous declarations. So this was a minimalist approach, and that is the reason why the European Commission decided to set a um, to, to set up a, a set of rules in terms of uh, protection, uh, which means that you are uh, the right to forget, so the right to can, to um, cancel data when they are no longer necessary. Um, the um, uh, standards uh, dealing with uh, transfers of, of data as well are provided for. So it's not just about data; it's about organisations. Organisations need to put in place uh, um, tools that. Uh, enable them to uh, carry out maintenance, maintenance uh, work in terms to be uh, complying with the uh, various provisions. So the power of regulators has been strengthened in all 28 countries. There will be regulators with sanctioning powers in all 28 countries, which isn't the case uh, so far in the 28 EU countries. Second element, the right of citizens, because very often uh, information is submerged by policy, so people will give, the, give their uh, data without even being aware of it. So when it comes to profiling, uh, when it comes to uh, various um, data handling that can be fairly intrusive, you need to have a consent, an explicit consent uh, beforehand. Uh, uh, and it's also the case for uh, uh, data dealing with children. They will have a specific status. And then there will be an obligation put upon companies um, because declaration is a statement uh, is, is not worth much, um, an awful lot. So companies, when they have a new treatment, it's all a bit technical, but when they have a new uh, way of uh, processing data, they have a privacy uh, privacy impact assessment study to see what is the risk for individual freedom. Uh, companies also have to carry out audits on a regular basis. So there are a number of obligations imposed on companies, and this will in turn strengthen what is called the uh, effectiveness of the uh, regulatory framework. I'd like to come back to the personal cultural data. That type of data is much more intimate, as it were, much more private than any other data. And that is the reason why we discuss it. We discuss it because the main players have uh, uh, jumped on uh, this uh, private uh, data. We realize that they are, have a, a great deal of added value. They can be sold uh, four times uh, for four times uh, the amount uh, other data are sold for. This is a true commercial value. It's not value as in value moral value. I mean, that's up to you to decide, but I'm talking about um, capitalistic value. Uh, I mean, after all, here we talk about the economy too. Um, and these are, these are sensitive data, admittedly, but they are not legally defined as sensitive data, as are uh, data regarding uh, politics, uh, sexual orientation, or health. Question without microphone. So we see uh, that uh, data can be processed in greater volumes, uh, much uh, uh, at a greater speed. There is an increased access to data, private and uh, personal data. 
Well, yes, if you look at uh, the way these uh, personal cultural data are used, you think mostly of uh, advertising by digital uh, um, supports. So that is the what's um, the main players on the international scene are, um, are doing. But there is also a less visible part of this iceberg, which is uh, the uh, predictive logic and the statistical logic and the way it can be used in order to uh, formulate recommendations. It cannot necessarily bring about added value, but the uh, drivers of these are uh, but these are the drivers of uh, Amazon, for instance. Uh, one third of uh, sales by Amazon are linked to these recommendations. Netflix, uh, Spotify, as well, are quite emblematic examples in the field of music this time. So these are logic types of logic that uh, draw on uh, uh, new audiences because uh, you will be familiar with what is more likely to be interesting for these uh, audiences. Now, uh, the uh, digital platforms are the first generators of uh, private personal data. So we believe that players, although they are in the background at the moment, can come to the fore and uh, they can uh, bring about a new commercial value and use value in terms of usage by um, personalizing the relationship with the uh, users. Well, beyond predicting uh, tastes and preferences of, of individuals, you could even go further. Is that what you mean? You could offer uh, cultural products they wouldn't have thought about, uh, because that is basically the objective, uh, broadening uh, individuals' uh, horizons, not just meeting people's needs uh, in, in keeping with their own preferences. Answer, yes, we use data, uh, databases, uh, uh, but then you need to have a creative logic and you have to be quite innovating in this logic in order for it not to be too standardized. Uh, and this is a genuine stand, um, a challenge for players in the field of uh, creation and production. For people are not necessarily used to having a personalized um, relationship with actors and players. So this is what we called a culture of data. So it's about uh, uh, going beyond uh, uh, people's reluctance, uh, saying, well, this uh, has an added value uh, and it needs to be demonstrated. I don't know whether you want me to develop this further because it's all fairly complex and complicated. But uh, there are an, there's a number of groups, for instance, in uh, media, uh, press, um, showrooms, uh, they know their customers, uh, they know their users, they work on uh, subscriptions, they have relations, uh, direct relations with their users, with their audio audience uh, or the end user. And uh, you realize how many sources of data there are and how quickly this data is, uh, are being processed. And this was not uh, taken into account in their relations with their audience. Uh, so what is at stake here and what is the main stumbling block is to go beyond modes of organization that are traditional to go for something that is more fluid and uniforms more the approach of uh, the audience and this is the challenge and this is what this drawing is about uh, you can see here how uh, uh, you try to organize and structure the uh, data and uh, in the sector you uh, will be struck by the number of uh, data bases uh, almost as many as there are department or departments or, or even uh, computers. So you need to restructure the data and reorganize it in order for it to be useful and helpful. And this is something that that uh, Americans uh, describe as chief data officer. This is this is the job created. Uh, but the idea is basically that you need to ha have a way of organizing things uh, so that it can be useful for the end user and also uh, relying on new skills. The moderator, thank you very much. Well, now we can uh, have a look at the BNP Paris uh, Bar, Philippe Torres and Mathieu Soulet study. Hello. Well, we have to catch a train, so we're going to speed up our presentation. So if you want to look at it, uh, you can uh, download it from the www.atelier.net. 
website. So Matthew and I will make this presentation, uh, Big Data Build Culture is the title of the presentation, but Big Data is not about technology at the moment, it's not about big either. We will see that it is all about the increasing power of data in the decision-making processes. Um, decision-making processes are increasingly autom automatic decision-making processes. Now, one example, big data has a history, and the, this is a history of a change of scale, change of scale which uh, leads to a paradigm shift. Uh, something happens between 94, 96. Uh, this was the emergence of internet, uh, internet becoming uh, accessible to the broad public, and internet moved from a few thousands to a few tens of thousands, and then reaches very quickly one million users. So the best service of access to internet, Yahoo at the time, was basically uh, insufficient to uh, provide the uh, service that is. Uh, access to internet and in 1997 the challenge is well we will need to automate um, to automate this uh, decision making process and that will be what google will be the first one to uh, realize and to um, uh, make real so there is the paradigm shift and uh, google will say well it will no longer be done by human beings it will do be done mostly by machines and i think that is the background Let's have a look at the, uh, the impact on cultural data now. Well, the history is that of Cafe Google. Now, th the impact on uh, cultural data, since that is the question, is the following. To have access to cultural data, cultural um, uh, information, you have what are called digital dragons, and they, they manage all this. There are uh, risks of uh, dominant positions, so this will need to be uh, managed. But there are also new uh, economic growth opportunities, and we will see this with uh, ministries of culture. And then you need to have a look at the best way to move towards uh, data management mechanisms. Now, one example, the risk of dominant position, Google. Right now, thanks to Google, by using its uh, search engine, you can find a, an answer directly. Uh, most questions asked on the internet find an answer thanks to Google, or Google will find the answer to those questions. How? Well, through statistics. Statistics analyze the data, and when it comes to the most frequently answered, uh, asked uh, question, they will build panels. Here you can see up here the panel, uh, the answer panel, and they take position one, and on the right there is a fact panel, um, pulling significant facts relating to questions asked. When it comes to culture now, Google uh, uses internet uh, and it uh, suggests a question number one and then it suggests other questions in order to uh, move to other information. And this is uh, the abuse of dominant position. This exists in uh, on internet, but it will also be true of our data because Google is organizing my data, your data, everybody's data and companies' data. Uh, in keeping with this principle, dragons in general, not just Google, uh, all the dragons generally. So how can we get ownership back of our data? Because it is value. Uh, Yahoo, Google know exactly how to get uh, value out of this data. Now it's up to us to find a best way to derive uh, economic value from, not just economic, but proper value from this. Now opportunities for the uh, uh, first followers when it comes to uh, data marketing. First of all, there is the uh, field of games, the Simpson tape outs, for instance. So that's one game. You, you uh, build a city like SimCity, Sim City, and these are electronic arts. Uh, and uh, it uh, analyzes the number of data, the number of buildings, for instance, of Gerger, uh, burger restaurants, for instance, the number of donuts. Uh, this is the uh, virtual currency of the game. What is the purpose? The purpose is to uh, um, uh, optimize the time played by the player because it is paid for by uh, product, product placement of ad or advertising or uh, you buy uh, the virtual money through euros or uh, dollars so this is a way of making money so for electronic cards this is a way of making money 25 percent of the sales are done through digital means and this is the uh, standard for the industry of games because this is precisely the anal analysis of data now a second very briefly a second example of data driven management this is what we move towards at the moment so the first example which is that of Netflix 
and uh, video industry. We have discussed it uh, previously. Netflix is the uh, rental uh, online rental service. It will also have recommendations in the future. So now what you can do is 75% of the content is visualized thanks to Netflix and um, with recommendations uh, too. Now, a second example, this is to do with the music industry. Pandora is a, a research project. Uh, with the objective is to uh, define a, a print a footprint for a uh, music piece. Uh, Pandora Radio will be created very soon, from, and uh, you create a, a playlist depending on your taste and then the algorithms is uh, um, improved by what is called crowd wisdom and you can see pictures here on the picture and this will enable us to improve uh, enable them to improve their uh, search engine what does this mean for culture generally speaking uh, does this uh, issue of big data is uh, uh, bring about a big culture uh, is it a catalyst for economic growth for culture big data now it would be interesting to have a look at all the uh, uh, to different um, cultural sectors. Tourism, for instance, here, the Mont Saint-Michel and the map of France are seen by tourists. Uh, Atou France, uh, which is the organization in charge of promoting tourism in France, looked at uh, um, public data, namely pictures taken by foreign tourists uh, of France in order to see France as seen by uh, cameras of uh, foreign tourists, in order to see where tourists were going in the territory of France and in order for uh, them to have their geographical origin in order to improve it. This was one example. So this was MFG Labs, uh, the first uh, experiment, and then the sex second experiment, and this was the uh, South of France uh, uh, tourist, uh, uh, Tourism Authority. We use uh, Orange, uh, the operator's data, uh, on uh, uh, mobile phones to see where they went uh, in France uh, in 2012 or in the South of France, and the paradigm shift is about uh, the improving of the decision-making process by public authorities. So the objective is here to have a feedback uh, loop in order to to improve uh, the situation. If I may interrupt you for just uh, one second and uh, answer your question. For us, it is difficult to uh, draw a distinction between cultural data on the one hand and personal data on the other. So what we're trying to do is uh, to uh, feed the reflection in order to see uh, how uh, personal data, for instance, can bring about uh, value creation by c establishing a link between our data, and our cultural data, and other cultural data. because. Google didn't look at value in the raw data. It looked at the value of the link that exists between various raw data. And applying raw data to cultural industry is about making sure that each industry and each uh, Connex industry uh, be in position to identify the type of raw data that can be linked with one another, uh, thus enabling us to uh, withdraw value from it. Now, very briefly, what sort of synergy can exist between the various operators? In the sector of entertainment and tourism, for instance, that these are uh, natural uh, partners. You can see on the left uh, Disney pictures. Uh, Disney have what they call the magic band. These are bracelets, uh, which means uh, you book your trip at Disney, you record your, you register your personal data, and when you come into the entertainment park, uh, then you have your key, your uh, means of payment that is all included in your bracelet. This is uh, Disney magic uh, pushed to the extreme, which means you have a no portfolio, uh, no wallet, and uh, your kids don't need any money. One million dollar to create the system. It was tested in uh, the uh, park in Florida, and then it is this deployed elsewhere. And then TripAdvisor, this is on the right, and you probably know it because it's in the field of tourism, and you probably know the link that there is between the various actors, because when you travel, uh, you go to Disney, maybe you will rent a car before you go there, maybe you will rent a hotel, maybe you will go to Miami when you go to Florida. So there is a dynamic that can be used in order to exchange these processes in order to create value through this synergy. And to conclude, we believe that the ideal ecosystem, in order for everyone to be able to identify the data, uh, is the smart city ecosystem. So a town or a region that invests in the infrastructures, because you need infrastructures to measure, and then it is redistributed. The information, the processed information is redistributed, and the ecosystem uh, looks at it in order to see what value can be uh, drawn from it. Uh, so it's all about the state and the companies, uh, startup notably, that can work together in order to make sure that it's not just about uh, digital dragons creating big data and finding the added value. Thank you.
the moderator. Thank you very much. Well, this is all fascinating and uh, very comforting to a certain extent, so, uh, because uh, uh, we see how you, there is a link with the various initiatives with the state not being completely absent. The state still has a, a, a role to play, uh, working with cultural industries, and uh, perhaps uh, it also uh, mitigates the risk of a dominant position uh, of monopoly. Uh, when there is a, when competition is a, when you focus on competition on the freedom of each player it is important to make sure that there is no monopoly and this monopoly that is already a reality for some actors some players is a position that is extremely uh, worrying uh, and it can also bring about a uh, change uh, in uh, the sectors of activity because people collecting data could also end up uh, producing and producing contents on the basis of these data. So these are two changes. Well, first of all, there is a reality. There is a monopoly, or there are certainly dominant uh, positions by a number of players that this needs to be uh, uh, fought against, but also this change in the business activities is also currently taking place and we observe it. Well, thank you for shedding light on this. And uh, now, Thibault, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Jan Thibault, we would like to uh, uh, give you the floor because uh, for companies such as uh, Spotify, the use of data uh, is, of course, extremely important. Uh, it is at the very heart of uh, some of the uh, of your uh, standard setting services. Now, could you tell us uh, more specifically what is expected of it? Because I'm sorry, it may be a very naive question, but sometimes a, a naive question uh, is, is a good way of introducing a debate. Of course, when it comes to collecting and processing data and uh, building algorithms, uh, uh, things are becoming increasingly complex and reliable. Consumers are very uh, satisfied with this because it's much more relevant. The offer is much more relevant to users, uh, much more in keeping with their own taste and their own priorities. This. Uh, but there's nothing new there. It's always been the case. Ever since uh, trade has uh, existed, uh, there were files for each uh, customer uh, drawn up uh, by uh, shopkeepers in a way. Uh, they knew who were their most loyal customers uh, and you created uh, added value by uh, offering something that could meet uh, your best uh, customer's uh, needs. Uh, could you, uh, Jan Tebo, tell us whether what is uh, currently happening is just a, uh, an extension of the phen phenomenon, or is there a quality paradigm shift? Well, it's a bit of both. Uh, we've always uh, used uh, and handled data, and of course, uh, uh, even with the first uh, technology, we've always uh, been able to access a pretty uh, specific uh, data. The interesting thing is what difference uh, does it make to a creator? How can we make a positive use of data? Because as you pointed out, uh, uh, we are, I mean, users are very happy with the uh, uh, with the applications and so on, but uh, creators and artists are in a position better to understand their audience thanks to these data because, of course, uh, it works both ways. I mean, I mean, the audience can discover their art, but the artists can see uh, who, I mean, if they are musicians, who listens to their music, uh, it, should they uh, change uh, the uh, uh, their their records or should they uh, adapt their tours to di di different audiences if there are more audiences audiences in certain parts of the country or if there are other parts they should go to because they haven't been g gotten enough exposure I mean it's a way uh, to uh, to uh, make the, the 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 art the artists meet and find their their audiences so in a way uh, data mining uh, can be um, uh, can optimize things. Well, uh, consumers and users can have access to things they hadn't thought about, and that could be of great interest. But uh, I apologize to be the devil's advocate, because otherwise there wouldn't be much of a conversation, would there? But in any case, couldn't you say that for an artist to have uh, uh, access to a huge amount of uh, information about the audience's preferences, the fact that you can almost uh, tailor uh, uh, your your work to the s tastes and needs of your users that 
takes us away from the true uh, authenticity. I mean, when you're an artist, you shouldn't sort of uh, try and uh, cater for the the taste of your uh, of your audience. Then you wouldn't dare do anything completely extravagant because uh, uh, you would be afraid to lose your audience. No, no, you shouldn't worry about that. Uh, th th these things can still happen. Well, just how would can it happen, surely? Well, uh, look, there's only so much you can do with data. I mean, if you're doing music and you want to please your audience, that's all very well. F fair enough. But there's always the human dimension. Uh, we, it's not like uh, we, we don't just uh, customize our, 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 our work just to, uh, to, 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 to please the audience. I mean, you, there's always unexpected stuff, things that were not, was not sort of produced by algorithm. Just because you have lots of uh, uh, lots of useful data doesn't mean uh, data or that doesn't mean that art is uh, uh, automated well but there are works of arts that, that were rejected by the by the public i mean the bataille d'an uh, ernani by victor hugo or the the right of spring by stravinsky this was rejected by the public well look you can't always please the public and, and at the end of the day it is for the public to decide but you an artist has got to to try to uh, to try their luck and see what happens uh, 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 of course an artist would like to please a l large audience Look, uh, yesterday we discussed art uh, or, or culture uh, curation. Who is the ultimate curator, uh, prescriber of a culture? Well, it is the public, but it's, uh, well, on the one hand, you can be very original, but the other one, you, you may want to uh, cater to this, uh, the taste of your audience, and then you're not original at all. But regarding public uh, satisfaction, what is it, I mean, uh, the public, likes to be known, likes to have almost a relationship between the, well, the, 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 the public and the artist, because usually you don't know the artist. So you, you have, a, uh, in a way, you are flattered as a user, as a, as a spectator, uh, to have somebody know your taste, uh, take an interest in you. I mean, in a way, uh, the, you, you can generate some form of, of satisfaction. But So you, you can be pleased and, and flattered and satisfied. You can also be a bit worried that people uh, are, are sort of putting their noses into your personal life. I mean, even if it's uh, to please your, uh, to please you and to suit your taste, look uh, again for music. Um, it's not being experienced as an intrusion. Uh, the, uh, it's seen as uh, something useful. Now uh, there was a time when on Facebook uh, we would publish the songs that they listened to, and then some people said, "Look, I don't want my Facebook friends to know what I'm listening to." Uh, so uh, now. Uh, we could have private uh, listening sessions so that you can decide whether or not you want to publish your musical taste. So, uh, but when you did that, you uh, you hadn't told users that uh, suddenly uh, their tastes would show up on their walls or whatever. The people, uh, so they discovered this and then they were not happy about this. That's how it happened, right? And so how did it respond? You said that some there was some negative response. What, 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 just what happened? Well, we got emails from users who were not happy happy to find their uh, favorite pieces uh, posted on their walls. Uh, I mean, maybe we were a bit naive there. We thought it was a nice thing to do to show, well, this is a sort of, I mean, what we give uh, widespread exposure to their musical taste and, uh, but, uh, well, because people felt that the, there was an invasion of privacy. Was these uh, service providers who were, were, not, were not happy? Some users, uh, some Facebook users said, so uh, now you wouldn't do something like this without asking for permission first. Or, I mean, or, or at least people cannot do this. Oh, this will not happen without their concern. Well, we learned from our mistakes, of course. This was, uh, we didn't, I mean, this was an honest mistake, but of course we don't impose anything on our, on our users. Now, uh, within the economic system we are working in, and of course you pay great attention to the things like this, and that's a, that's a case in point. But um, uh, so uh, there's always that risk that uh, 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 people might not uh, want their data to be published. So on the one hand, uh, people uh, expose themselves. So th this is a balancing act. How do where do you draw the line between protecting privacy and and publishing people's data? What are there some fundamental lines along which you could find sort of a happy medium between protecting uh, the person's privacy and and of course giving that person some sort of uh, of publicity, which would thereabout 
bring uh, thereby bring some some well economic benefits because of course if if uh, if you have if the commercial industry can have access to that data that they I mean including the cultural industries then they can they can prosper using that data so where do you draw the line well, uh, uh, there's some uh, principles of ethics. I mean, of course, uh, you have to do things uh, legally, responsibly. Uh, you shouldn't uh, overuse or overexploit data. I mean, th th these are some basic principles. But also, at the same time, as you pointed out, uh, it is for users to take uh, ownership of these services. And, and then, so if they use this, if they interact, then they, they can broaden the field of uh, of possibles, and then of course it can be it can be put to good use by the cultural industries. But it's a it's all done on a on a, volu a volunteer basis. I have some question uh, for our friend Stefan Wachenfeld, who uh, works in Germany. Um, English or in French? No, no, in French we don't speak French. No, I would prefer, I would in, in English. Yes. So perhaps I, I will uh, ask you a few question in English in that case. You know, just uh, something very interesting happened in France uh, recently. On seventh October, uh, Facebook made the announcement that it will share its data with TF1, which is the main private uh, TV uh, channel in France, and with Canal Plus. Um, as it did before with uh, American and British uh, uh, media. So now uh, TF1 and Canal Plus will have access to comment commentaries on their programs, which are left behind uh, the Facebooks, and uh, they are quite numerous, 18 million each day. Uh, how do you, what would you say about that? How do you comment on that? Yeah. Um uh, that's a good question, and um, I also really like the discussion here. Um, so, so um, I think uh, one thing I want to say is that it seems like a bit like a game. So uh, companies have to understand that uh, people don't act uh, in the internet truly. Like, uh, I don't want my songs to be published because I want to pretend to be someone else. It's the same with these comments for the TV channels. So the TV channels have to understand that whatever the comments will be, it might not be the true opinion of the people. It might be what I think the comment would be that my friends like best. So there's a, another level of uh, thinking and uh, that is required to interpret this stuff um, directly. And then uh, the other thing is, uh, you know the expression, don't shoot the messenger. Uh, so I think this is going on already. So Facebook is sharing a lot with everybody. Um, it is sometimes the bigger companies who are a bit slower in jumping on the train to actually getting access to that data. And um, I think the problem is that they are not so quick in uh, adapting to the paradigm change. I think you uh, mentioned it also in your presentation. I like that very much. We come historically from thinking in categories. And then if I hear people here talking about data, we think about uh, age or uh, um, gender or like things that we can put in categories okay uh, gender there's two or more um, and uh, so um, we have arrived at a point where we don't have these kind of data we have more like events um, we look at the behavioral data which is millions of little data points that are by itself not really data um, and that need to be, uh, you said it, that need to be connected and the value is in the connection. And understanding that uh, is the key to also deal with those comments. If you don't uh, know how to connect the data to, to create information, let's say, which is data put into context, then uh, you won't be able to create the value. Um, yeah. So it's a kind of a call for disconnecting you know, that data from some kind of a, a personal expression. It's only a, a very, very tiny part of individual behavior which is left behind in data. You, you, can, you can tell nothing about that, you know, let alone uh, knowing the person who is behind. Um, I don't know, maybe I didn't understand you right, but what I want to say is that um, 
like in the past we tried to make a website and say oh this website is about movies so let me start with uh, comedies uh, action movies uh, whatever serials and stuff and um, this is not how the world works anymore if you look at your children yes. if you look at digital natives if you look at your own behavior you don't want to go to a website and browse categories you want to be able to just type in maybe even just an an actor you remember playing in the movie and the right movie should pop up independent of any category. So that means on the back end, behind the scenes for what the computer scientists and the technicians have to uh, install to make that product uh, ready to be used, they need to put all kind of tiny dots of uh, data pieces and connect them in a way that uh, the system is able to generate this kind of answer and that is very difficult you know like yellow pages uh, was going down and all these kind of old school uh, products that relied on on categories they go down like uh, gmail you don't put your emails in folders anymore like you have them all in one permettez juste un mot c'est if I may, the world always works like this, but the world that you describe is a world that moves very quickly. Our world uh, still works like this, I mean, with categories and such like. But uh, just could you be more could you could you be more specific about the way you are using values and personal data value or this very tiny uh, um, base of information which has to be pro which have to be processed into values? How do you use them in your spe in, in your specific business and what kind uh, what the way in which you create value economic value from them? Um. Yeah, so I mentioned behavioral data. For us, uh, my business is uh, uh, related to games. Hitfox Group uh, does uh, business with game companies and we do customer acquisition for games, but we also do customer retention, which means we also look at in-game events and help companies to optimize the game itself to make it a better game because we realize that people get bored if, uh, for example, the next level comes too late or uh, it's too difficult. So how do you analyze that? Uh, the old school way would be uh, to create a survey and to write an email to some users and ask them how do you like our game. And the new way is to just look at a hundred million people playing uh, and you look at five second intervals and you create a huge pile of data and you kind of crunch it and uh, that is the part that requires um, humans because there is no uh, book where it says on page 13 what the, the right way to do it is. So um, uh, what our contribution is or value contribution is understanding game mechanics, uh, helping to um, set up the analysis and to derive conclusions and that um, in an automated way, kind of to engineer a system that is then able to um, give the recommendations automatically or to, in terms of customer acquisition, to if you, like on the, on the one hand we have the game advertisers, on the other hand we have uh, m maybe a thousand sources of uh, traffic where we advertise, it can be blogs, websites and so on. So you want to identify the, the streams of traffic that are the best for a certain game, so that is where you want to advertise. But you cannot do it manually, so you have also there the machine learning, which learns, oh, this is really good for this kind of game, and maybe strategy players I, I find there. So um, I hope this makes a little bit of sense. Yes, so it's a immediate, it, was a, it, it is to, uh, really focused on the, and targeted on the immediate benefit of your, uh, of your customers. Yeah, I mean, we try that. Uh, it can be, um, it is new for some people, uh, or like you remember when you first bought something on Amazon and you got a recommendation and you're like, whoops, uh, and, or you bought a, a Christmas, like I bought a Christmas present for my mom, it was something completely different. And then, then I realized because as long as this stuff was uh, related to my, uh, my likes, I, I never really realized, but then when, suddenly something came up that didn't really match me, then I remembered, oh, yeah, I, I bought a book for my mother, so then uh, mm. Amazon was uh, assuming that I switched taste or, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so this can be shocking also in advertising if, if I, uh, for example, you, you go to a dating site once and then uh, you get all dating advertisements and you share your computer with friends, you don't want to see 
we want, do you don't want your friends to see that you're getting dating advertisement because people that understand the mechanics in the internet, they will automatically know, oh, you're going to dating sites. You know, so this is uh, something that companies have to respect and uh, be very careful. It's uh, yes. uh, similar to uh, what Jan just said. Yes, and if I may go to a broader question, you know, of course there is a paradox in the fact that uh, um, uh, uh, internet users publish a great amount of uh, personal data, uh, particularly on social networks, while also demanding a limited right to uh, access and protection with regard to this data. So there are two, two trends. So is that a paradox for you? And do you think that, and uh, would you say it doesn't concern you uh, directly your business, but broader, than, uh, beyond that, do, would you th uh, say that the fact that people are happy to publish a certain amount of uh, personal data implies that they accept uh, their data being made available in a, in, in a disseminated, uh, generalized and unconditional way. And uh, even if some uh, uh, critic of modern, critics of modern life say that uh, online activity is characterized by some kind of exhibitionism, that it means or imply a kind of consent, consent for f further users? What would you say about that? Yeah, to first to the if it's a contradiction, I think it's something that was always around and that also companies have to deal with, also governments or anyone who's who's working with this. It means that uh, you have to make sure that you provide more value uh, or that the value perceived by the user is higher than the cost perceived by the user. So by cost, I mean uh, I'm kind of revealing myself or or um, uh, giving information about myself that I might not want to give, but if the benefits are high enough, I'm happy to do so. If uh, Facebook allows me to see the pictures of my nephew and nieces, that is a high value for me. So then, um, okay, I will share my opinion on those pictures and so on. So I think this, is, uh, this has been always around, this uh, internal um, um, calculation of people, whether something is worth it or not, but what you say is true, like you have to educate people because sometimes it's uh, that they unknowingly share data or unknowingly give insights to their behavior. So I think that is a big point. Um, and um, um, I forgot your last point. But, uh, no, yeah. that, that, um, you know, it's not because uh, people consent to publish a lot of information about them that they will agree if they were explicitly uh, uh, informed about the possibility of this information to be used in a disseminated way. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I think um, sometimes they, they, they unwillingly uh, do it and might not, dis might not agree if they knew what they're doing actually. Um, but this debate has, a, has also a danger. It leads to this uh, shall we opt in or opt out debate and what should the regulatory uh, body say to this. And uh, it's a game uh, and in a game uh, people behave like in game theory, so also companies do that. So in, uh, in places where there is an opt out, for example, it means uh, I as a user say I don't want to get this advertisement. The companies say, oh, this is interesting. Uh, which kind of advertisements don't you like? And <laughs> then, oh, you don't like sports and this and this. Ah, oh, let, let me create a profile of what you don't like. So actually, the good intention of providing an opt-out uh, is turned around into something that, uh, again, uh, it defeats the purpose, kind of. So there is no way out, <laughs> probably. <laughs> Thank you very much. So now we are uh, going to uh, Rudy Klaus Nitzer who is a, a writer um, and uh, you are an absolutely uh, very involved in all kinds of uh, cultural business, publishing and other very important things. And uh, you are an absolute expert on uh, the question of big data and you published a very important book, Dascende uh, des Zufall, the end of a how coincidence or chance is not that easy to translate uh, the Zufall, how big data make our us and our lives predictable. So, first question, why the end of, uh, of chance coincidence? Wh which is the thesis behind that, uh, related to because, our topic? Because in many, in many areas we can avoid coincidences which uh, we don't like, 
uh, in certain areas the, by better knowing uh, and predicting the chains of action. So if I can predict uh, the chain of your attention, then I can organize my chain of communication so that it's not a coincidence that you listen to me. Uh, this is used, and we, we heard a lot of uh, examples uh, uh, in businesses uh, like supermarkets and, uh, of course, in social networks and uh, so on. But first, I think it's not uh, necessarily the, the consequence that I have a better knowledge about how the consumer is behaving that I follow this behavior. But I can know it, uh, and that might help me. Uh, and another thing is uh, that uh, we, we heard many symptoms, but I think the really big shift is that these technologies, uh, and we see this in, in the split between the older generation and the younger generation, is uh, we were brought up by first understanding and then doing. Now it's first doing and then understanding, even understanding by doing. Uh, you, you can uh, make the experiment if you give uh, a complicated smartphone to a 10-year-old, uh, he will start like pushing buttons. A uh, 50-year-old or 60-year-old will first say, okay, stop, 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 I have to understand it. Yeah? So, so this uh, creates problems on the one side, even in teams working together, and on the other side, big chances. For me, the interesting thing is uh, there was one, one very interesting a tiny bit of information, it was the value lies in the link. We are talking about uh, personal cultural data uh, as if uh, they were separated and uh, an entity. Yeah? I would like to, to introduce uh, um, uh, a term which um, is not established so far. I checked it in Google. <laughs> uh, and it's interesting because it uh, is the cultural graph. Yeah? Uh, we have the social graph, and Mark Zuckerberg built Facebook on, on it. We have the knowledge phase. Google uh, built the Google empire on the, on the knowledge graph. Uh, but the cultural graph could depict one's cultural relations not only with persons, uh, but also with locations, with, with, with events, with media, with artifacts, even with thought and opinions, and with the possibilities of analytics and algorithms we would be able, of course, much better than we can do it now, to predict cultural behavior, uh, enhance cultural experiences, but even predict future thoughts and opinions, which I know sounds frightening, but uh, uh, this, this will be the future. And uh, so I think we should concentrate on this, and uh, we should really think about how such a cultural graph, it will start with your question, uh, what do you mean by personal cultural uh, data, of course, but also how are these things connected? And in combining, for instance, uh, Google Earth with cultural data and a cultural graph, we could have a new view on the world uh, in many cultural areas. And I think that is the big cha uh, challenge. Uh, and the other big challenge is that these technologies, of course, make machine learning uh, more efficient. You know, the singularity discussion, when will the machines be more intelligent as we? Uh, I think, uh, and I hope not, <laughs> but it will uh, create a situation where we uh, team, at, team up much closer with machines. So we will be uh, the combination of humans and machines uh, getting augmented intelligence, maybe even augmented creativity, in order to stay ahead of the machines. So that's a new definition of uh, you have to revamp anthropology, you know, including the, some kind of relationship to the machine, if not the machine itself, in the definition of human beings. But uh, you said that the, that will be the future, you know, and uh, we have to think about that and to, to try to, uh, uh, of course, foresee it and perhaps uh, to orient because there is, uh, so perhaps we disagree about that, but I'm not sure they are completely uh, determined future. So what kind of human 
interaction with my human decision or economic organization or some kind of, a, of norms whatsoever uh, could be useful in trying to, uh, even if that's the general picture of the future, to try to uh, orient it in a, in a way which uh, preserves the value of cultural creation, which is, um, and uh, the, the, you know, the entitlement of individuals to some kind of protection of what they are uh, doing and saying. Uh, no, of course, we, we, we need protection of uh, personal data, and uh, we need to establish trust, which is not established in, in, in this area. Uh, and uh, uh, what, what we need is more a code of ethics uh, and a kind of social contract uh, more than legislation, you know. Uh, uh, of course, legislation and regulations also. But if we want to, to work it, uh, then uh, we, we, we don't kill each other uh, at the dinner not because there's legislation because there's a social contract on not doing it. Uh, if you look at the tax laws, it's different, yeah? Uh, there is not such a uh, social contract on, on, on taxation. So what we need, and, and I, I, I saw you are starting here uh, uh, with the declaration of the rights of internet users and creators, uh, we need a code of ethics um, uh, to establish this trust and to protect. Uh, let me just uh, explain it in one example. More and more we are, uh, we are moving in the direction that we don't need causality, we just see patterns, and the patterns put you uh, in a certain condition. And it's a kind of precondition. Yeah? You are a pre-cancer patient. Uh, you are a pre-not-repair uh, uh, of your loan. You are, predictive policing is one example for this, you, you might fit in the cluster of somebody who steals a car. Yeah? And there can be a lot of discrimination. And therefore, I think we also need uh, a kind of understanding uh, and regulation that we cannot be included in clusters without knowing it. Otherwise, we will get a Kafka world where uh, uh, you go to the bank, and uh, uh, the, the man in the bank says, no, you, 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 you don't get a loan. Yeah? Uh, he does not know why, and you doesn't know why. So that's, uh, uh, that's why we need protection, of course. Uh, and uh, uh, there are also some other things we, we, uh, we need. We, uh, we have to fight the fear connected with it. Uh, we have to switch on the light. That means better understanding. I, I remember when I was a boy uh, uh, living in an apartment house, there was no light in the basement. Yeah? And uh, we made a, a kind of uh, uh, who is the bravest. So you have to get, go down and get something out of this dark uh, basement. You know what I did? I went down because I didn't want to be considered as uh, weak. Yeah? But I closed my eyes. Ridiculous. It was dark, but I closed my eyes because that protected me. And this is a situation we very often have in, uh, in dealing with these issues. Yeah? We don't know about it, we are afraid, so we close the eyes. And the third one uh, is uh, fight the digital divide, because it will minimize your markets, uh, and uh, uh, it, it, it will uh, prevent us from, from harvesting the benefits. No, I do agree with you that uh, 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 collective awareness is as important as uh, legal regulations and uh, who will have uh, to be implemented worldwide, which is a very difficult issue. But nevertheless, uh, don't you uh, underestimate the, the mimetic drive or collective behavior and the fact that people consent to what exists instead of uh, fighting it and, uh, or trying to improve it? Uh, people are not fighting it. I, I, I was at a discussion last week, yeah, and there was a, 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 a young lady, and she uh, said uh, she doesn't want to to take part in this whole data craze, and uh, she want she is not giving away any data. Uh, and then I asked her if she using a smartphone, and she, she said yes, of course, yeah. So. So I think uh, uh, we, we have been on this crossroad many times in history. Uh, when we invented new things, we invented France, uh, 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 the, the X-rays. Yeah? Uh, if we have first regulation, 
innovation will be uh, very, very tough. And I, I don't want a future where uh, we, we separate uh, America and Asia is doing the innovation and Europe is doing the regulation. Yeah? That will not work. <laughs> Thank you very much. Il y a peut-être des questions. There might be questions in the room, and we could hear uh, uh, our audience uh, reacting to what has been said here around the table before closing the session in a few moments. Uh, that was a very interesting uh, discussion. My uh, question is to the panel uh, today. We are generating uh, close to two zettabyte of data, which is uh, probably more uh, in one day than what uh, was done in the previous 2,000 years. Uh, most uh, experts believe uh, that in 2020, we will be generating one yodabyte of data, which is a million times more. Uh, coupled with this is the fact that as uh, internet technologies develop, and we move to web 5.0, which is expected in 2020, uh, not very far uh, away. Uh, what web 5.0 does is that it moves from semantic web, it crosses uh, the, the web 4.0 and goes on to what is called the intuitive web. Uh, where uh, uh, one of the things would have happened in web 4.0 is the ability of machines to talk to machines. In such an environment, not only do I find our regulations, but our social preparedness uh, good enough to be able to handle the kind of large data which is supposed to exist in 2020. So what do you think needs to be done to one on the regulatory front at a global level and two from both the technological side and, and the cultural side to be able to handle the kind of exponential explosion which we are going to see in another five to seven years. Thank you. One second question before you uh, try and answer to this question. Well, I have a very simple question. Chesamel, philosopher and uh, uh, I have understood that the power is now in the hands of content prescribers. You describe a rigid psychological exoskeleton. So we have a sort of protection shell which is supposed to protect us, but in fact the protection shell is now using us. So do we have a way of protecting ourselves? And is there such a thing as an alternative big data, as there was an alternative globalization? movement. So there is a capitalistic logic, a perverse uh, logic. Uh, first of all, there were utopists and uh, dreamers, and now they work from within the system. So could you say that we can uh, see uh, the uh, emergence of uh, alternative big data, so people using the matrix but creating ex uh, networks outside the matrix? Well, thank you very much. Uh, could you please uh, very briefly answer these questions? Uh, no, this panel much uh, and in two minutes, so be brief. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you for the questions. I I'll start uh, in the back order. First, uh, with your questions about the content prescribers. I think it's also happening already because uh, also you earlier asked uh, uh, how about the authenticity about artists. And I think, especially in the culture uh, area, there, there always was the trend to to get into the top ten, to create the blockbuster. Because normally distribution of content was related with cost, like distributing my CDs, my, my physical devices, putting the movies in the cinema. And now I think uh, uh, one contra-revolution could be the use of uh, niche artists, niche kinds of music, who using big data, who using cultural personal information about very maybe isolated uh, and spread individuals to find their audiences. Not audiences in a classical sense of there is a cluster of people somewhere, but uh, 
you know, all the single dots and because uh, the transaction cost is uh, close to zero, I can really serve them with my product and, uh, and I can stay uh, authentic because I do the music I like and somewhere there is someone listening to it. So I think that is a little bit going on. Uh, and to the first question, also me? Oh, yes. <laughs> Okay, yeah, what can, do be, uh, what can be done in preparation? So first of all, I see this uh, exponential uh, increase in data. Okay, everything that uh, increases fast is called uh, exponential increase. So um, I don't know how much it will increase uh, in total. I think the point is currently the value of data is unknown. So just to make sure, we, we save everything and we try to find out what the value of the data is. So if you go into a big company, you, uh, as a consultant maybe, you say, oh, what kind of data do you have? And then we, oh, we have all kinds of data and then, oh, you could use it for this and this and this. And then the business guy comes in and says, okay, what's the business case? What is uh, the cost? I know what is the, the revenue on this? And then, yeah, we don't know. So uh, you try it out, and I think uh, in 10, 20 years we will have a better understanding of what the value of data is, and uh, storing this million times more data than we have right now will not be for free. So I think there's an auto-regulation just in terms of cost and revenue. Just currently players are trying to avoid to be behind, and they take some, some upfront investment to be first movers and to be quick. And uh, culturally, what can be done? <laughs> <laughs> educate people. Yes, good. Uh, you know, as a good, general answer to all kind of problems. That so, Rudy, close it. Uh. Yeah, I think uh, um, the best uh, the best way uh, that the the question about data amount was already answered. And uh, don't be afraid about all these figures because the more data we generate, the more redundancy we also create. So uh, much of this data uh, volume. Uh, is already there in one or the other way. But uh, uh, the, the, the question, the very inter interesting question, how can we uh, support and foster uh, uh, anti-movements and uh, revolutions uh, against the digital re revolution? And I think the best way is to uh, uh, give access, equal access, uh, that means to really aggressively uh, support initiatives and startups, regardless if they fail or not. Uh, trial and error is very important. And this revolution start, uh, think of yesterday, uh, there were two uh, different sessions, and there were the two worlds. One was the session with the ministers, yeah, uh, very organized, very well presented, uh, 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 very rhetoric. Uh, uh, and then there was the hackathon, which was completely chaotic and interesting, uh, but that's where the new anti-movements are coming out. So uh, be, be optimistic, uh, because pessimism doesn't help, uh, and uh, there are reasons for optimism. Mm -hmm. Merci. Merci.